Well, every night I go out running Or riding my bike I like the sweat, I like the flow I get, I like the feeling of the night air Hitting my lungs I like the feeling of rain While sticking out my tongue Sometimes I like to pretend I'm on a secret mission Sometimes I'm just making sure it's not something out there happening That I'm missing and I swear to you I get a real high from it Fuck alcohol and fuck all that shit and fuck TV Let's meet up with our bikes down by the old train bridge I'll race you downtown and I'll show you what you miss from me inside And let's live our lives tonight Let's ride our bikes into the night And let's live our lives tonight And at last, we are recording. All right. All right. Uh, hey, everyone. Welcome to the Garrett Schalke podcast. I am your host, your boy, as always, Garrett Schalke. And uh, today's guest uh, comes to us straight from the great state of Kentucky. He is the author of novels such as Brown Bottle, Alice in the Windigo, and, uh, oh, fuck, what did I write there? God damn it. <laughs> Sorry about that. And uh, he's also the author of short story collections such as The Same Terrible Storm, Where the Alligator Sleeps, Sway, and most recently, Absolute Invention, which, uh, speak of the devil, is actually kind of what we're here to talk about today, since he has his collected short stories coming out soon. Ladies and gentlemen, let's uh, give a warm welcome to uh, Sheldon Lee Compton. Hey, thanks for having me on, Gary. Yep, Sheldon, thanks for coming on. And, uh, yeah, dude, it's good to hear from you again. It's been uh, some time. Yeah, it's been a little while. Um, <clears throat> I appreciate you mentioning Alice in the Windigo. Not a lot of people uh, mention that book, uh, so I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, I, I apologize for not naming the last novel, because, uh, no. once again, my chicken scratch just, my chicken scratch writing just fucks up everything. You're good, honestly. I'm going to tell you something right now. I'm sitting here trying to think of what the novel is. Can't think of it myself. <laughs> oh, man, that's a sign of a true writer right there. If you, <laughs> that's if you, Yeah, if you can't, if you've written so much great work that you can't remember it all. <laughs> nah, I just, I don't know. I'm getting old, bud. <laughs> yeah, as I mentioned, uh, it's been some time since uh, we've been in contact. And uh, full disclosure, folks, uh, yours truly has had his work published in... Uh, Sheldon's uh, literary website, Revolution John. Yes, indeed. Absolutely. I was happy to have you. Yeah, last time I checked, it's still going, correct? Yep, still going. Yep, still going, taking uh, submissions every day. Uh, I've been doing that since 2013. Yeah. All right, nice. And, uh, well, I guess we can talk more later, but, yeah, I actually plan on submitting some stuff soon. That'd be great. Uh, Send it right along. Uh, maybe this year, but more likely next year, since, uh, well, I've been having more fun just writing than publishing, and, uh, yeah. and, uh, I announced on Facebook and Twitter, but my day job decided to start our, uh, holiday overtime work early, so, um, I honestly don't know how much writing I'll be getting done. Uh, you make time for it. Yeah, so, somehow, some way, I will do it, but... Yeah, we that, always do. Writers do, you know? Yeah, but, goddamn, is it frustrating. <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit, it's a little bit. Well, the thing for me isn't so much trying to find the time to do it. Um, it's just, I don't know, hoping that the time I have to do it is that I produce good work, because I'll write pages and stuff, not pages, but I'm old school, I started on a typewriter, but I'll write word count, word count, word count, and sometimes the, word, uh, sometimes the words are just no good, and so that time spent wasn't productive. That's all I really honestly worry about. I mean, as far as making time, I think we probably make time, it's just can we make good use of the time. Hmm. Uh, I've, I've never had that problem, like, as I'm writing, thinking it's going to be bad. It's more right. so coming back to it later, especially, yeah. like, oh, okay. especially years later. Like, uh, recently I came across some poems that I wrote 
like well over a decade ago. They were just yeah. stored on my computer. And, uh, yeah, fucking cringe. They're pretty bad. <laughs> well, but, uh, you know, I often find, I often find that I don't really, I'm not able to, um, I'm not really able to save much of that old writing, but now I'll hang on to titles for years. Oh, really? You know, I, yeah, like, there's titles, I'll think of a title and I'll kind of put it back in the old storage unit. And because I know, hey, that's a good title. I'll something something later will kind of will come up, and that title will work. And I've done, and I've done that a lot because I'm I just I love titles. I'm just real big on titles. I think that's your, that's your doorway into the story. Why wouldn't it be exceptionally important? You know. Ah, okay. Uh, me, uh, it's not really titles. By despite what I just said about the work that I just discovered. I will hang on to it because I'll probably um, recycle it in some way, if you want to call it yeah. that. You know, use take chunks of it, yeah. Yeah, you know, use it in another work as a jumping point or do like good old William S. Burroughs and do some cut-up stuff with it. Yeah. You know, it's all good. I try to recycle... I try to recycle stuff before, uh, before I just determined that it's just completely unsalvageable and just yeet it off. Right. Yeah. Well, there goes a truck up the road, Gary. Sorry about that, buddy. There's, like I said, there'll be some sounds uh, happening out here. Uh, dude, if, if you listen to the past podcast, especially with uh, the longstanding GSP guest champion, Zach Elmblad, we have had plenty of noises on here. Oh, good deal. Spe- yeah. Especially in the... Especially around summertime, uh, a lot of fan noises because it's uh, pretty fucking hot here in Michigan. And uh, yeah, we know it'll make noise, but we don't feel like having a heat stroke while we're doing a three, yeah, four good. hour Joe Rogan yeah. level podcast. Absolutely. So, where about so are you at in Michigan? I'm in Grand Rapids, Michigan, the second okay. biggest city here after Detroit. Okay. How about you? Uh, where are you at in Kentucky? Uh, Pikeville. Um, yeah, Pikeville, Kentucky, Pike County, Kentucky. It's the easternmost uh, tip of Kentucky, so. Oh, okay. A, abs- absolute tip, yeah. Yeah, uh, been, there, the most... been there for a while? Yeah, all my life. I mean, that's just how, that's how you're going to find folks around here. Uh, most people that's here have been here their whole life. We don't, we don't really head out. There's a little bit of brain drain right after people graduate college. They'll head off to Lexington or some other place. Um, but they always come back within about about five years or so. They come back. Oh. Uh, I, I, mean, I don't know why it is. You hear, I guess you hear people talk about Kentucky being real clannish or whatever. And I stopped thinking about why we do the things we do a long time ago. But, yeah, I've been, I was born in Pikeville. I've lived here all my life. Um you know, I did. I moved off for a while. Went out to um, Lexington and Berea, which is kind of like the central part of the state. But that's typical. I came back within about. I mean, I, I was there for a couple of years and came back. Yeah, uh, yeah. We we talked before we started podcasting, but uh, nice weather right now. Yeah, yeah. It's good weather. I'm out. I'm out here. It's a little bit, uh, just a little bit warm today, but. I tell you what, usually when it's pretty, I'm out here doing something uh, outside the house here, trying to work or something. But I took today off, and I'm in pajamas. I ain't working today. Ah, uh, there you go. That's the way you do it, I brother. Really yeah, and, uh, now, I'm gonna write, at some point, I'm going to write, you know, at some point. I'm not sure when, but at some point, I will. I try to write every day. I know it sounds cliche, but I really do, you know. Oh, God, that's that's half of my thoughts, you know. I'm going to yeah. get to it. You know, it's going to happen. Right. And then, well, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Right. Yeah, I'm going to always sit down. Like, what I do is, it's kind of strange. I've not really ever thought about it, except for, like, when I was younger. I, I spent a lot of time thinking about it. But what I mostly do is, I, if I'm at a computer screen, I'll do whatever it is I sit down to do there. And then I'll just take time and... I'll, I'll open up a document I'm working on and I'll write on it for a while and, and then I'll go back 
to doing something else. So, you know, um, I just write in these kind of little bursts, not productive, but these bursts throughout the whole day. Um, I don't know if honestly I, I can even help it, to be honest with you. I know that also <laughs> sounds cliche. That sounds precious as hell right there. No, that's, re- that's, you know, that's sad to hear, Sheldon, because I need all the help I can get, man. Buddy, you just, you just sit down and write it, and eventually it'll be all right. It'll be good. All right, about uh, you, you, you uh, just mentioned that you write on a computer mainly? Yeah, laptop, yeah. That's helped a lot with, um, you know, I went from typewriter uh, when I was in my early 20s. I got typewriter when I was, I think I was 12. Um, I started writing on the typewriter when I was 12, and then, of course, you know, I moved to desktop, the old desktop, you know, and... Uh, that was the thing where I had to be there at the house in front of that computer. But now where I can take this laptop with me, I just take it with me and I can write, I write all day long on and off with it, you know. Sometimes I'll be watching television, but I'll have it on my lap, you know, just watching television or something. So it's just mm-hmm. kind of like a, it's always sitting there in front of me in case I want to write something, you know. Yeah, uh, I'm actually attempting to uh, get into uh, writing first drafts of my work on the computer because uh, well, long-time fans of mine might know is that, uh, yeah, whenever I complete something, like, let's say a novel like I recently did, I will gladly put that up on Facebook and Twitter in order to brag about it. And... Uh-huh. Uh, as you might see, it's all writing. It's all written longhand in a notebook. And, uh, oh, yeah. yeah, that is a pain in the ass to transcribe. Yeah, I, have, I couldn't. I've never done, I've never did that. I, um, I, I always wanted to be that kind of writer because it's a lot. You have more of, you know, you're connected to the writing a little more, um, I don't know how to put it, but... Yeah, that's actually how I describe it as well. Like, yeah. I've, uh... I have written on, on the... Solely on a computer before. Especially when I was a reporter previously. But, uh... Yeah, it, se- it always seemed like, uh... I just... Well, one, I just couldn't concentrate fully... You know, typing. And it's, oh, not, yeah. it's not just the distractions like internet. You know? Oh, right. And just as you said, you know, you kind of got more uh, of a feeling of control, more of a uh, connection there when you're there writing it down, you know, making the letters, you know, putting yeah, it on the paper. Yeah, there's some kind of connection there. There's a, a physical connection that's just a little bit lacking on the computer. Yeah, but uh, at the very least right now, I'm determined, well, I got one more novel that I'm, uh, currently writing i started a notebook so i'm gonna finish that then but after that from now on at least when it comes to novels you know on the computer you know i'm yeah i like my latest one called a uh, godin the gladiator killer coming I out in tw- coming out what i said i love that yeah called a uh, going the gladiator killer coming out december 2022 uh yeah um it's God, last time I remember, it's like 238 written pages. Okay. And now I gotta transcribe that bitch, which is <laughs> probably gonna take about a month. If wow. I, if I take it leisurely. That's kind of quick, really, isn't it? Well, it's... You're, you're, you know, when you get in there and start, like, you know, taking the written words and typing them out, um, it, you go pretty quick with it, huh? Well, yeah, I've kind of got a routine for it. And yeah. I fail it, but but at least I keep trying, which is pretty much I'll go, like, type out ten pages a night. So, you know. Uh, wow, okay. So, you know, seven days a week, that's 70 pages. You know, adds yeah. up. Yeah, for sure. But, man, it is an awful pain in the ass. I hate doing it. So, uh, at, least when it at least when it comes to novels, I'm going to try to write computer only from now on. Short stories yeah. and poetry, um, up in the air. Yeah, yeah. No, that's pretty awesome, though, that you, uh, you do that. I mean, I know a lot of writers who do. And I honestly, like I said, I kind of wish I was uh, more along those lines, you know, writing stuff out in longhand. My writing is, my penmanship's pretty bad. I can't keep up with it, for one thing, but. 
Oh yeah, mine's awful too, but I'm used to it, so <laughs> and as you as you can tell, it can fuck up co- podcast intros, but other than that, it works for me pretty well. <laughs> You're fine. I tell you what, I can remember, you know, I, I used to talk about keeping old work. Um, I wrote my first novel. I, was, I guess I guess I was twelve, or it must have been eleven. Uh, oh, nice. Before I got before I got my typewriter. Well, you know, here's the thing. I took line to see, you know, paper that had the holes. What do you call that? Damn it. Put <laughs> the holes in it so you can put it in a folder, you know? Mm, uh, line paper. Line paper with the holes in it. Anyway, I took uh, red notebook paper? Yeah. I wrote to exactly 100 pages because I thought that's what a novel was. You know, I'm talking about I was 11 years old. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So I wrote a hundred pages in longhand and took three bread ties and tied them in through those holes and tightened them up. And I still have that book. Oh, That's really? The only thing I, yeah, I still got it occasionally. I get it out. and I mean, it's not a novel. It was a, obviously it wasn't a novel, but it was just a series of little, I don't know, you know, little vignettes all tied together. I was just trying to get to a novel count, you know. Yeah, but I, did. I, I hung on to that bastard. You know what I mean? Yeah, was this when you uh, started writing? Yeah, I, I started writing around uh, ten or eleven. I had a buddy introduce me to Stephen King novels, and uh, I found that's a lot of people my age kind of I think came through uh, started out after having read some Stephen King because he's the master. Um, and I read. He, he introduced me to that. I read some. Then I started writing stories. Uh, basically, just trying to do what he was doing. So that's kind of what. Yeah, I guess I was about ten. And um, at twelve, I asked him for a typewriter because I was already wore out with writing it down. But uh, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Uh. Oh, actually. Uh. Let's uh get into talk about the subject of today. But, um, I have one last weather relay question. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Weather's down there, down there is nice now. Uh, did you, uh, get caught up in Hurricane Ida? No, we got some thunderstorms. Uh, when, when we get hard rains here, uh, we get, you know, on the mountains, we get, on the hills, we get groundwater. And that's just water. It's soaked in. And what's happened, what happens is it comes down off those hills and we'll get a flash flood situation where we get a lot of water. Uh, we have a little bit of flooding um, in that case, in this, in most recently. And then it kind of eases up. So we got a little bit of flooding, but nothing, nothing significant. But that groundwater comes off the hills like that, off the mountains. It can cause real quick because you think, well, we're not going to get anything. And all that water is stored up on that mountain. Mm-hmm. It's stored, you know, and then at some point, just like a cloud, that water breaks off that hill and comes washing down into the valleys. So, but we didn't really get too much this time with the hurricane out. I mean, I have a student, I, I teach in a program, and I, I have a student from New Orleans, and she, uh, we had to make accommodations for her because um, I do the uh, online deal there. I teach online this, this MFA program. And so she was talking a lot about, you know, obviously she got, she just got wiped out, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we had to make some accommodations for her, but not here. We didn't, we didn't have too bad a deal. All right, and you're honestly safe, right? Yeah, I'm good. <laughs> it takes a whole lot of water to get up this high. Okay. Yeah. All right, uh, all right, brother. Uh, let's talk about the main topic of today. Uh, you have a new book coming out. Matter, yeah. matter of uh, fact, yeah. it's a collected short story collection. Yeah, it's it's my collected stories. Um, the idea, the thought of that, you know, I've I've written um, a lot of short story collections, um, and over the years, I since probably I guess well, I wrote my first book, had my first book published in 2012, and so I've got, I've just got this whole. Um, this whole body of work, these, uh, these these short stories, which I'm primarily a short story writer. I don't consider myself, I consider myself first a short story writer. Um, 
secondly, uh, more or less a prose poet, and then I consider myself a novelist. So, um, short oh, stories are my main thing. I think they're the greatest form. They're the the best the best form of writing. Um, not form. Uh, anyway, you know what I'm trying yeah. to say there. Yeah, it, it's a form. You can call it that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but my collected stories, I'm really excited about that. And I, I'm not, you know, I get excited when I have a book coming out. Um, obviously, I have less ambition now with uh, publication and with sales and stuff as I used to. Uh, so that excitement is no longer there for me. Um, most of the time, I'm just ho- I'm just happy to have it out there and for people to read it. I've just got to that place in my career. Um, but the collected stories. Uh, to me, that does feel like a milestone, mm-hmm. um, you know, and so it's going to be out there. It's going to be pretty chunky. It's going to be a pretty good, um, uh, I'm just real excited about it. And, 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 and if you think about it, anybody that does uh, have, read, have read my stories and enjoy any of them, well, they'll all be in there, if you know what I'm saying. Like, if you like one story I had published seven years ago, and you don't know, you know, I've got some of my books are out of print, um, which is one of the reasons I'm excited about it, too. My first collection, The Same Terrible Storm, it's out of print. Um, I, you know. Uh, I believe I have that one on Kindle, actually. Yeah, yeah, you can get it on Kindle. Um, they put it on Kindle uh, in order to more or less salvage it. Um, uh, not salvage it, but it's available to folks. Um but I'm still excited that it'll be in a book form again. You know, there's the stories are all going to be all together again in a uh, in a book somewhere. Somebody can buy it if they want to. I'm still old fashioned a little bit that way. But uh, you mentioned Kindle. Everything I buy now to read is Kindle. Uh, I don't I don't buy a lot of hard copy books anymore unless it's a friend of mine whose book doesn't. You know, obviously you can't get it on Kindle or something. I'll I'll uh, get the hard copy. Yeah, I'm pretty half and half when it comes to buying physical and ebooks kind of depending yeah. on kind of depending on my mood and uh well also like on the price of some things like like I've like I remember getting a couple books these past 2 years on Kindle because uh the physical book, copy of the books are like for whatever reason like they're out of print are just shot way the hell up but oh, yeah. the Kindle or Nook ver- version is like ten dollars. Yeah, everything. That's what I like about it too. But you know, it's like ten bucks. Ten bucks, you can go get about any book you want on Kindle. Period. Uh, most of them not gonna go much higher than that. But I've seen some lately. I love Michael Robbins, uh, the poet Michael Robbins, and his. Books. Oh yeah, I'm. Oh yeah, I'm familiar with him. Are you? Oh my gosh, how good is he? Oh uh, yeah, oh yeah, he's great, but damn, it's been a long time. Yeah, he his books are coming out now, and some of the others, some of these big dogs, you know, they'll come out and it's fifteen bucks for a Kindle or something. In that case, I'll just buy the, the hard copy. I strayed away from collected stories there just a little bit. Um, kind of wrap it back around to that. Um, honestly, uh, like I said, I'm less concerned now about sales about whether or not a book's going to be uh, nominated for uh, something or whatever. Uh, so at this point in my career, I just want people to read my stuff. Mm-hmm. And and that way I can I can tell whether or not they enjoyed it, if they'll be honest with me. That's something I really, really value. Don't tell me it's good if it's not. Don't tell me it's good just to... Because that's what you think I want to hear. That's not what I want to hear. I want... I want to know that you enjoyed something so the collected stories will give people a chance to see my entire short story body of work and they can say well you suck and <laughs> I bought it and I regret it um, maybe I'll try your novels or they can say well man I hadn't read that from you before and I really liked it and you did a good job I mean affirmation I guess just from from uh, you know everybody's looking for it who's writing they are you know I am still at this point I've been writing and publishing for nine years now, a decade, you know? Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, so that's what I look forward to that. I look forward maybe to some new readers getting a hold of it or, and let me know that they enjoyed it, you know? All right. Uh, I've looked around to see if I could find the collection. 
before you told me it has yet to be published. But, uh, yeah, um, care to reveal what the title of the collection is going to be? Yeah, well, it's not going to be, you know, uh, a title collection. It's, um, you've seen these books. I mean, like, the collected stories of Amy Hempel. Oh, uh, uh, God, I was thinking about that the other day when I was, uh, yeah. writing up the qu- Bring up the questions for today's interview because uh, okay. that's one of my all-time favorite books. Yeah, the collect uh, the collected stories of Amy Hempel. Um, and she actually yeah. and she actually put out another uh, short story collection uh, two years ago now. Uh huh. Yeah, it was uh-huh. all it was all right. Oh yeah, I know what you're talking. About. I can't remember the title, but yeah, uh, it was, a, it was a very very slim volume, and it was all right. Right. I enjoyed it, but didn't blow my mind. Right. You know, I got to think about something the other day. A writer, they, I don't think they can sustain, you know what I'm saying? Like, once you hit a certain age, your work is not going to be, it's not like Picasso stuff here. You can't keep doing the same type of work you're doing that you were doing when you were in your early 20s or mid-20s or something. You, your mind's just not going to be as sharp. You're not going to write as good. A, it's real rare. I'll say that it's not impossible, but it's rare for a writer to get to their 60s, 70s, uh, late 70s and still be writing as sharp as they did when they were in their 30s. And Amy Hempel, I think, might have hit her prime sometime back. I hate to even say that. It's blasphemous. But um, I read that same uh, collection. You're talking about the collection from Hempel? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I read the same thing. And I thought that when I read it, that was my thought. I forgive a little bit easier now when I see... Um, I mean, like I mentioned Stephen King earlier, uh, being an early influence. Well, you read his stuff now, and it's super hit and miss, right? It's incredibly hit or miss, um, I think. He's not writing The Shining anymore. He's not writing, um, you know, Cujo. He's, he, even though he was blown out of his mind on drugs <laughs> when he did that. Oh, yeah, I think, I think that was like <laughs> uh, the one novel that he says that he can't remember writing at all. Cujo, yep. 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 It's one of my favorite ones, too. I know. I think, uh, I don't want to say that his being uh, an addict, an alcoholic, Im- improved his work, but I mean, <laughs> proofs, proofs in the pudding, right? I mean, a little bit. <laughs> hey, man, they say the same thing about Eminem, you know, the, yeah. the great the great rapper from my home state in Michigan. Absolutely. You listen to some of his both. stuff now, and it's like, wow, I kind of wish you were still on drugs. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. See, I'm a recovering alcoholic, um, and when I was writing and I was drinking, I've been clean and sober now for six years. Um, so, and I've not felt any spark of creativity that was there then, and it isn't here now. But I really think it is the case for some people. I think if Faulkner had quit drinking um, too early on, we would have never had the sound and the fury, or you know what I'm saying? Well, yeah. But, but it, it, it only ever clogged me up. I mean, it just you can't you can't write when you're absolutely. I mean, I would drink from, and I would drink from. I would get up at eight in the morning, and I would make myself go back to sleep until eight forty five because the liquor store didn't open until nine. All right. So I would go out at nine drink, and I would drink until I passed out that evening, and I would drink nonstop throughout the entire day. I taught college that way, mm-hmm. um, all of it, and. To be honest with you, the work I've got in collective stories, did some of those stories, were some of those stories written while drunk? Absolutely. 100% they were. Um, well, were they edited and reworked sober? I tried. But, you know. Um, so, Actually, there's going uh, to be weak spots there, and it's because of the drinking, you know? Yeah, it's funny. Um, there's another writer that I like, and... Um, He's been open about it, but I won't name him on this podcast. But uh, yeah. it, the rights to one of his books actually uh, just got brought back to him because the publisher shut down. But that's uh, actually pretty exciting when that happens, to be honest with you, because you got your work back, you know? Yeah, I know, right? You know, I have to try to co- get in contact with them for, like, past royalties or yeah. the rights back. Yeah. You don't have to put up with the frustration when they just don't fucking respond. Cause they exactly. don't care anymore. But anyway, but yeah. His rights back to that book. Anyway, yeah, this writer uh, got his um rights back recently. And he's glad too because uh, I guess he suffered a nervous breakdown in the middle of writing it. 
and okay. apparently it's wow. very evident. I've never okay. I've never read the book, but uh, he says that it's very evident in qual terms of quality. Yeah, so, you can kind of see through the book. You can if you looked at it closely and knew what was going on, you'd see places where he was not well while writing. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know. I guess he's gonna like edit and get it, get it republished. Good. And it's great. Yeah. I think it's awesome to hear to, to hear about that. It sounds like it's bad. You know, my publisher went bust. <laughs> well, it ain't great. It ain't the worst thing that can happen to a writer. Yeah, and really, uh, these days, especially when it comes to indie publishing, uh, you should probably expect a publisher yeah. or a magazine or a website to go up fairly often and fairly fast. Yeah, yeah I'm glad you said that. That's something I've thought about a lot. You know, you're going to, if you publish, I like to publish almost exclusively at online journals now. I don't submit to other journals. I just submit exclusively to online. I think that's the thing to do now if you want readership, right? Right. Well, when you're doing that, and I like to also submit to new online journals. I won't name any of them that I've sent to and had work published in and have since folded, but you have to be aware that that is the very, very distinct possibility that, you know, um, Joe Blow over here who starts an online journal has every good intention of doing it for 20 years, but he's probably going to do it for a year or two and then things are going to come up and he's going to go do something else. And there goes your site. You know what I mean? That had your work on it. Oh, okay. geez. Um, year, years ago, uh, there's a bizarro writer that I like. His name's a uh, danger Slater. He, yeah. Danger they, Slater. Yeah. He's a great dude. He, uh, posted a meme that says, I guess, uh, perpetrated to be like a grandchild saying, you know, hey, Grandpa's a writer. Grandpa used to be a writer. Let's check out some of his work. And then uh, they took a screenshot of, you know, this website is no longer available. Exactly. Exactly. 404. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that is true. Grandpa was, Grandpa's a writer. Well, where's the proof? Well, you know. <laughs> yeah, let's check out his work. Click. Yeah. Nothing. I'm like, I'm like one major global computer uh, uh, crash away from being unpublished, you know what I mean? Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm, yeah, all my work, except for like, I don't know, a handful of poems or whatever, have been published online, mainly yeah. because of, uh, one, a lot of online mags fit my style and aesthetics more, especially when it comes to writing, you know, pulp and superhero fiction. Sure. Oh, and, yeah. uh, and one of my greatest weaknesses, my, probably my main weakness as a writer, is that I'm impatient. And, uh, yeah, you could get, yeah, there's a lot quicker submission or uh, rejection oh. time when it comes to online mags than uh, print sure. ones. Like, yeah, and I, I mean, I don't even, like, I sent the last print magazine I ever sent to, it was, I had forgotten I submitted to it and got a rejection, like, I don't know, like 11 months later or something like that. And I thought to myself, man, what in the world am I doing? They, the people ain't even going, the only people that's going to read this print magazine are other writers. Yeah, especially if those mag magazines have like a stipulation saying like, please don't submit this anywhere else. It's like, <laughs> yeah, wait, wait, right. wait, you want me to not submit it only for you to reject it like a year later? Yeah, form rejected a year later. Yeah, honestly, the, uh, actually, the longest longest it ever took for me to get a rejection actually was uh, some little online magazine, and uh, the reason I'm saying this because uh, I th it took about three years for them to write me back saying they rejected it. <laughs> Why even bother at that point? Yeah, know? it's like three years later. I'm like, oh <laughs> wow, and these two poems that looking back now. Yeah, I can see yeah. why they rejected it, but, sure, but three you know. years, fuck. Well, I, I tell you what, like I said, I've been uh, I've been publishing. I've had several little online mag, not little, but I've had online magazines that have since gone the way that I just couldn't keep up with. I I had one called A Minor Magazine, and I I got online and said, anybody want to take over editing a magazine, online magazine? I got a response back that afternoon. It was out of my hands, and they ran with it since, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I had one I published called The Argonaut. Um, 
and I had to stop accepting submissions for that. But one of the things I always tried to do was every single rejection was personal. It was a personalized rejection, and I liked keeping my response time to an average of about a week. And you know what? I got a pretty good load of submissions and was able to keep that up for five, five years, six years, seven years. Why in the world can't somebody do that? Why does it take 11 months? Well, I mean, for a print, yeah, but even an online, I've got I've got some submissions out. I've submit less now than I used to. Mm-hmm. I think I, I think I've got maybe four or five stories out there to um, some upstart online magazines, um, and I do that for because I want to. I've got a lot of stuff published, and like like I said, online online journals that are just there for about eight seconds, and then to second ten you look and they're gone. But I, I have one that's out. It's been out for about ten months, nine months. Mm-hmm. And you mean to tell me they can't get to read some in nine months? They ain't no longer than about five hundred words, and they can probably tell whether they like it after two sentences. Just send it back, to say, "Buddy, no," and then go on. You know, I, I've been. Am I being critical right now? Well, yes. <laughs> and, no, you should you be. Know, no, you should be critical because. A lot of these places have garbage policies. I mean, and so now I'll go in here in a minute, and I'll definitely have a rejection from that two months. Uh, uh, you know, after this, maybe after this podcast. But yeah, um, have, have you? Uh, older. Yeah, have you uh, ever yeah. been rejected for uh, formatting it wrong? Formatting uh, your work wrong? Gosh, that would that would be infuriating. No, I haven't. I haven't had that come up. I don't think. I've had that happen. Like when I first started. You know, I'll give yeah. my I'll give myself some leeway there because uh, you know just started publishing, but I've had like a few times a couple of years ago when I was submitting stuff where uh, it's like okay I did everything as they said submit go right. then I get rejection saying you did not space it properly so we are rejecting it it's like are you, it's like are you fucking kidding me come on <laughs> I mean yeah. Some of these, I was saying, like, I was I was worrying, and that's why I said, well, I'm being critical, but to be honest with you, I don't care anymore. I'm old. I publish exclusively with my fiction and uh, with one press, uh, like, when it comes out in book form, I mean. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So if online journals never publish me again, I'd still have my work out there. And so sometimes I'm a little bit loose-lipped about the process, and... I don't know. I don't know what to say about that. That's just how I am now. I guess I'm a little bit of an old man or something, but um, hey, at the end of the day... Uh, how old just, are you? Uh, 45. Ah, uh, 45, okay. Yeah, I'm 45. So, a lot of the... There's a there's a whole... there's a. I started publishing in 2009, and in that time to now, there have been so many young like younger crops of really talented writers who have a certain uh, niche you know and it's exciting to see all that but for a while when i was still somewhat young i'd try to write sort of to that does that mm-hmm. make sense oh yeah um i found out real quick you know i'm not i'm not that that doesn't work for me i i can enjoy those writers um, and the, I'm thinking of people like Danker Slater. I'm thinking of people like um, those guys. Um, and I enjoy their stuff, but there have been times I've sat down and thought, well, I'm going to try to write something that's absolutely fucking crazy. Uh, bizarro. Was, a Bizarro book. Right, right. I love Bizarro. I read a book recently called, um, oh my God, called Cows by Matthew, Matthew Stokey or Matthew Stokey. Oh, yeah. Uh, I almost ordered yeah. that. I almost ordered that a few months ago, but my uh, gift card I got ran out, so I had to save uh, for later. Grab that one up if you like Bizarro. Um, that I, along with uh, the Wasp Factory. The Wasp Factory is that his too? No, no, different author, but they're both considered pioneering transgressive books. Okay, okay. I'll have to get that. See, here's, here's the thing, actually. I mentioned earlier I consider myself a short story writer, a prose poet, or whatever, first, second, last. I'm a reader first. I think we all should be, or we all are, right? Mm-hmm. 
And for me, reading is more important than writing. I don't know how many writers you'll hear say that, but if they were really being honest, I think at the end of the day, do you enjoy reading more than you enjoy writing? Yes. I think the answer would be yes just about across the board because writing is hard work. <clears throat> that, that's one way of putting it. You know? So, um, I'm a reader. I keep up with uh, my reading and what I've read and what year I read it in. And I keep a list, a reading, a reading list I've kept since 2011. Um, and to me, that's, just, that's more serious than anything else because it's my fun. You know? Yeah. I'm serious about my fun. Most, uh, most people uh, are, I guess. But um, I went, uh, <laughs> I went far afield there, Gary, and yeah. I got real excited when we started talking about reading bizarro fiction. It's just, it's really exciting kind of fiction, isn't it? Oh yeah, definitely. It's uh, yeah. one of my favorite literary scenes, one of my favorite genres. Even if I don't keep up with it as much as I should, some of my favorite people are in there, like Danger Slater. Jeff Burke, and uh, one of my big influences, uh, Carlton Mellick. Yeah, Satan Burger. Oh yeah, Satan Burger. My uh, my first Satan book Burger. of his was uh, The Menstruating Mall. <laughs> yeah. Yes. There's a fun, there's something, there's a, some levity to that fiction. I'm not going to say they don't take their writing seriously and they're not trying to put across big ideas, but there is some levity that's welcome. To me, anyway. Oh, yeah, there. I think every writing has some seriousness in it to certain degrees. Yeah. You know, even if, uh, uh, even if, even if a writer says, like, oh, I just put it together, no prob. It's like, right. like uh, yeah, okay, sure, sure you didn't, dude. Right, right, right. There's something, there's something working, even if it's somewhat behind the scenes for them. See, I love writing horror fiction. Um, and, I always have, and I've written, I'm called a Southern writer, I'm called an Appalachian writer, I'm called, you know, uh, the, the, the poetic novelist or whatever, and I've got all these things, but the real, the stories I love the most that I've written uh, in the books, because Alice in the Wendigo is a horror novel, fantasy novel, they are those, are the horror and fantasy, and um, I could sit and write stories about witches, honestly, no joke, Garrett, I could sit here and write stories about witches until I die and write nothing else and be totally fulfilled as a writer. Actually, uh, yeah, let's, uh, actually, yeah, let's get back to the short story collection there, because, uh, it's one thing I wanted to ask. Okay, yeah. um, it includes all four collections of your previous stories. And, yes, uh, let's see. Of, yeah, of, of, Terrible Storm, Where Alligators Sleep, Absolute Invention, uh, Sway, and I think that's that's all the collections. Yeah. 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 You uh, is there gonna be anything else in there like there before release stories or anything you've yeah, recently was, written? Yeah. The the publisher and let me just say Adam Van Winkle with Cowboy Press, uh, Cowboy Jamboree Press, Cowboy Jam Jamboree Magazine. Uh, I just gotta say his name and say he's amazing because if not, it would be ridiculous. The guy has published me for years now. Uh, he's got his own press there, uh, puts my books out exclusively ever since Dysphoria. That's the other novel. Damn it. Uh, How did I screw Dysphoria? God damn it, you're right. Guys, yeah, I, screw, I screwed up on uh, with my <laughs> chicken scratch with the S and the Y. That's why I can't read it. <laughs> God damn yeah, it. But, um, he's, but he's, he's awesome. He's great. Adam Van Winkle and the folks at Cowboy Jamboree Magazine, Cowboy Jamboree Press. Um, but, um, yeah, what were we saying? All four of the uh, all four of the short story collections are going to be in there. New material, new material. Um, I hadn't thought of that, um, but he did. See, he's got the smarts. So there's going to be about twelve new short stories included in that collection, mm -hmm. in that collected stories, which I would have never thought to do. I don't know why. I've read a hundred collected stories that have that same format, you know, and new unpublished, you know, stories. All right. So there'll be, yeah, there'll be a few in there. All right. And, uh, you mentioned that you view yourself mainly as a short story writer. Yeah. Prose, I guess, uh, I don't like, I've got to where now I just call everything pieces, but 
yeah, short story yeah. writer, or or maybe like a really short fiction, like the what do they call that? Flash like, fiction. Yeah. Yeah. Um. As as you were uh, putting together uh, your collected stories, um, did you uh notice how do you view your uh, progress as a short story writer from uh from you know same terrible storm to uh absolute invention? Yeah. Um, which is Sway. I think Sway was my last one. Oh, oh, yeah. it was. Yeah. Um, uh, my, you, uh, I, my apologies there. No, nah, I ain't worried about that. I just noticed it when you mentioned Absolute Invention. But yeah, there has been, as far as my first collection, The Same Terrible Storm, those stories are entirely realistic. They have no element of fantasy or supernatural or anything in them. They are the kinds of stories you'd find in an Appalachian literature collection, okay? All right. But for the kinds of stories those are, those are the best stories of those type I've ever read. Um, now, as, I, as you go on into my later collections, I begin to get a little bit, I don't know, I guess I begin to get a little bit more comfortable with the idea of my work being out there and being read. And I, you can see that I started taking other kinds of um, chances, other risks, because uh, it's safe to write. If you're an Appalachian writer, what's safe to write and what's marketable is the Appalachian story. Right, um, right. Like, like uh, previous writers, like Breeze, DJ Pancake, or uh, yes, or or current writers like Scott McClanahan. Absolutely. And now Scott, he does a different, he's got his own, he's got his own little drum there that he carries with him and he just marches right to it. He, you know, but yeah, he, he his stuff is grounded in, uh, in Appalachia. It's just that he has a different way of, he's extremely talented. He has a certain type of story he's writing. Oh yeah, he's, he's yeah. awesome. I mean, Crapple yeah, Isha like, is a wonderful book. Um, Yeah. But yeah, so the safe bet is if you're an Appalachian writer, if you live in uh, any Appalachian state that you can get by with writing sort of like a greedy, hard-nosed, you know, somebody down the road here has got a gun and he's going to threaten me later on this evening, me and him's going to fight out here in the yard. You know, does that stuff happen in here? Yeah, it does, and it might happen this evening here. Yeah, a lot of, po- a lot of poverty, a lot of nature, yeah. a lot of darkness. Dark darkness, poverty, a struggle, and I love writing that stuff. Sometimes when the mood hits me, I, if I want to write about like some dad that doesn't get to see his kids because he's an alcoholic and he's trying really hard to get clean so he can see his kids, that's great. That's great. I'll write that if, it, if the mood hits me. You know, it, there's nothing. There's not really much fun about that kind of writing, but you are exposing some truths. You know. Mm-hmm. What, what you'll find about mid-career for me is I started taking more risks and doing some different stuff where, for instance, I was writing an Appalachian story one time called, oh, uh, shit, I can't remember what the title of it was, even though I, but about halfway through I decided I, want something, I wanted something to happen and I thought, man, that would be very weird if I did that right here. And, and I can remember very distinctly just thinking, well, then just do that because whether this gets published or not, are you are you doing it? You know, there's a great saying. Um, I, I just went ahead and did it because I wanted to. That's the mm-hmm. key thing to get. That's the place to get to in your writing. Um, if you get to a point in your your work where you say, "Well, if I do this, it's going to be strange. People might not like it because they're expecting this to be an Appalachian sort of realistic story." And you don't do that thing, and you just write the story out, you're lost, man. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So you just do the thing. Um, Take the risk and put it in there, and if it works, it works. If it don't, it don't. But somewhere along the lines, that's what I started doing, and the work got more interesting for me. That's all I know how to put it. All right. Uh, All of your uh, pre... Okay, all your uh, pre... Previous collections, which are gonna make up this new new collected works, uh, mm-hmm. what would you say is your favorite um, of the of the collections? Yep. 
Um, sway, no question about it, Sway. Um, to, to date, to this point right now, Sway's the best book I've ever written. I mean, it doesn't matter if somebody else, you know, if somebody else thinks another one is, then I'm just glad to have the readership. But from a technical standpoint, from the idea that a writer should should write just exclusively what is on their mind to write and do it with some type of courage and bravery, Sway is by far my best book. And I remember the quote I was going to say a minute ago, and it changed my entire idea about writing and my entire approach to writing. Um, I can't remember the context from which it came, but the quote is this. Do you write to impress other people, or do you write to express what's in your heart? Sounds a little bit cliche. I've said cliche, I think that's the third time this interview. Oh, but, uh, th- dude, come on. That, that's nothing. I've, uh, <laughs> I mean, one, one, of my, one of my all-time favorite quotes that uh, has influenced my writing and life you're gonna love this. Is uh, yeah. by Kanye West. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Uh, back in the day when he first started, you know, put out College Dropout, he was mm-hmm. appearing on Chappelle's show with a uh, Common, another Chicago yeah. rapper, and uh, mm-hmm. I guess apparently before the show started, he, before he performed, he was uh, talking to someone on the phone, and he said, in relation to why he was on Chappelle's show, he said. I'm Kanye West. I do cool shit. <laughs> yeah. And this was back. This was back before Kanye, like his bi- fun, yeah. his yeah, it was fun before his uh, before his bipolar disorder really took over and before people yeah. hated him. Yeah. But yeah, that I, I love that. I love that. Yeah. I'm right yeah. C- else. Yeah. Kanye's my third favorite music artist, and uh, you know, behind Bob Dylan and Woody Guthrie. You know, oh yeah, there you go, Americana. Yeah, great, great place to put Kanye too. You know, right, uh, like right it. behind Bob and Woody. I do. I like that. Yeah, yeah but uh, yeah, but I do cool shit. I like that. Yeah, but that's but that's something that I think about when it comes to my writing and other artistic endeavors, like this podcast, for example. Mm-hmm. It's like, yeah, I want great success and to be influential and. uh you know, so some money will will help too. You know, it'd be nice if I had some some more of that. But but that's really something I think of. Like, am I have like you? Am I having fun? And yeah. like like Kanye, am I doing cool shit? And, yeah, I'm not doing, I love that. And indeed, I am. Every, every, when you say it, every time you say it, I just get a smile on my face because that's exactly the same kind of thing I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, you know, is to do the thing, the, do the thing that you think's cool, that you think would work, that you think would be interesting for somebody to read. Just do it, and and the reason you're doing it is because that's that's just what I do. There's no other motivation behind it than that. That's I just do cool shit. <laughs> you know, yeah, that should be every writer's credo from us, really from us to. Faulkner, the Hemingway, fuck yes. Shakespeare, even. Yes, I, Shakespeare I, needed that. I doubt does it for the cool for this coolness. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I can't speak uh, old British. I'm sorry. Yeah, there you go. Though, there you go. It truly is. It may have usurped my express what's in your heart because that's awfully serious and heavy. <laughs> you know. Yeah. All right. I do cool shit. I write cool shit. Yeah. All right. Uh, so Sway's your favorite out of the collection. Um. Do you have a least favorite? Um, least favorite? No, um, I don't think I have a least favorite. Though I'm sure there's some that I didn't put as much. Maybe absolute invention. Mm-hmm. Um, absolute invention. What I did there was I had a period. Excuse me. I had a period of about a year where I published a lot of short stories and they were all of a different kind of, uh, they were all over the place. And so I kind of, I kind of just collected those together and said, here's, you know, here's me just absolutely inventing, not thinking, you know, um, and I like the heart behind that. I like the thought behind that, but those pieces were, those were slammed out pretty quick. I'm proud of them. 
I wouldn't have had them out there if I wasn't. But they were written much more quickly and uh, then and without as much thought. And you'd think for, that would make them better, but for me, um, I got to kind of put a little bit more thought into it to make it to give it. Um, anyway, they were let's say they were dashed off a little bit because I never planned on collecting them. See. Hmm. So they were just pieces I was put like I'd find, there'd be a new online journal just started up and I, they would be asking for submissions and things and um, I would just say well let's give them some let's folks you know let's send them some stuff they're wanting to see some stuff so I would send them something and then um, they would accept it or you know whatever so those were just collect absolute invention is a collection of just stories I wrote over the course of a year that I didn't really have any intentions with them other than the one-time publication. Yeah. All right. All right. So, uh, short story collection, the uh, collected short stories, um, do you have a date for when they're coming out? Yeah. Um, let's see. October, I believe. Let's say November, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's say November. I'm trying to think of what Adam told me last. Um, I'm pretty sure he's going to start working on the galleys in October, and then we're going to. It's going to come out in November. Yeah, so November. I don't have a, a date uh, in November, but uh, the, uh, the joys of yeah. in, the joys of indie publishing. No, no yeah. hard dates. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, believe me, I'm the same way. I mean, I have all my books coming out in December, but when when in December, you may ask. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now, even yeah. I don't know that. Exactly. I mean, exactly. I do try. I do try to get it out before Christmas because uh, I like to delude myself into thinking that if I put it out before the holidays, that a shit ton of people will buy it and give it to their friends oh, and yeah. family for gifts. But that has yet to happen, unfortunately. Yeah. Someday. Yeah. Exactly. Just got to keep on going. Keep on trying. That's it, man. Just keep riding. <laughs> You're going to anyway. You know what? Oh, uh, yeah. Whether it, anything happens or not, you're going to keep riding, right? Yep. Which, by the way, folks, Anamaki, 5th Anniversary Edition, coming out this December. Nice. Yep. Look for it. Okay. So, uh, all right. So, now that we've talked about that and talked about the date, um... Got any, any other plans for uh, short story wise after the collected works comes out? Yeah, yeah, uh, I'm working. I'm working right now on a collection of western stories um, called Seven Drums, and uh, let's see, I have a collection I'm writing called Story of My Stories and Other Stories. Um, those are two collections I'm working on. I'm working on a detective horror novel. Called the Omega Problem, and what else? Well, I've got the pancake book coming out. Uh, the Orchard is full of sound. I got that coming out from. Uh, oh, that's a nonfiction book. So oh, it's not oh yeah, I do. I do remember. Uh, I think you t you post about that previously in the past that you uh, are writing a biography on Pancake. Yeah, it turned out I was going to try to write kind of a biography, and it turned out to be a memoir, more or less, about my my relationship with Pancake. Is you know, um, it's a weird. It started out like three hundred page manuscript, and now it's down to one hundred fifty page manuscript. I've worked on it since summer of two thousand eighteen, and just now finished the final draft. Oh hell yeah! Let's talk about this because uh, I because I too uh, have love for Pancake. He's one of my. Yeah. He's one of my favorite. He, he's in the category of, along with musicians, you know, someone who puts out like one work and that's it. Right, right. Pancake. Yep, yep. Uh, if I recall correctly, he uh, only put out like what one collection of short stories before his passing. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, and well, it, it wasn't published in his lifetime. Oh, it what? Stance, yeah, yeah. He got pra he got praise from uh, Kurt Vonnegut for it for his work. And, yeah, uh, um, and then yeah, he Vonnegut, Vonnegut was quoted. Most of the people who said anything about Pancake said it after he was dead because he's just a tragic literary figure. He 
he wrote a, a, he had a few uh, short stories published in his lifetime he got a wide acclaim for those um, and then he got a book contract with Little Brown for a novel that he never you know got to do he shot and killed himself and then his mom Helen and one of his former teachers I think it was James McPherson, James Allen McPherson, guy who won the Pulitzer for Elbow Room. Mm-hmm. He and he and Helen Pancake got together and got his stories put together and had it published after Brees' death. All right. Um. Well, I'll get the salacious question out of the way then. Um. Do Do you think uh, Brees took his own life or was he murdered? He was. He took his own life. Um, okay. There, I, you know, I've talked with people, I've interviewed a lot of people while doing this book. Uh, one in particular was this librarian in Milton, West Virginia, where Pancake's from. And she went to school with him and she said, Brees could have never done anything like that. There's something else that happened there. There's no way it happened the way they say it. And she said that to me. And it was very clear to me that she knew Brees Pancake, the guy who was so affable and kind and such a light of heart person, you know, she didn't get to see Breeze Pancake in uh, the winter. I mean, in the in the spring of of, of nineteen seventy nine. So that was a totally different person. Um, there's so many. There's so many um, indicators after the fact that he was going to end his life. He started giving away his possessions to his friends. Um, you know, he, he had written his mom on several occasions. I got to see those letters and mentioned, you know, there was some morbidity there, you know? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, no, he took his own life. Uh, he was an alcoholic, um, there at the end and he became incredibly drunk one evening and he was renting a cottage from these people in Charlottesville, um, and there was a lady renting another cottage of theirs, like nearby him, right? Right. Now, this is the last night of his life, according to police records. Um, the girl said she came home to her cottage and came in, and Brees was sitting in the corner of her living room in the dark with his boots off the side of him. And when she came in and saw him, there was a quick exchange, uh, like, what are you doing here? Sorry, I scared you. I think he said, he said something like, sorry, I scared you. I think that's what the police report said. Mm-hmm. He stormed out. Now, this is about 3 o'clock in the morning, okay? He stormed out of that cottage and ran back to his own, presumably. And then when, by, when, when the sun came up there a few hours later, he was sitting in a, you know, in a lawn chair in the orchard uh, having shot himself and killed himself. So... Those are the last few hours of his life. I mean, it's pretty clear. I think I'm, I'm just going to say, for my for my purposes, uh, from what I've read, what I've seen, which is pretty pretty good lot. He, he just killed himself. You know, there wasn't anybody that had any problems with him. He was a pretty good guy. You know. All right. <clears throat> uh, excuse me. Ah, <clears throat> uh, COVID. COVID. <laughs> Have you got COVID, though? No, no, I haven't. I've been, <laughs> I've been very lucky these past two years. Good deal. Uh, how, yeah. about, how about you? Uh, as, yeah, no. Yeah, actually, I should ask that. Yeah, it's one of those non-lyric questions I should have gotten out of the way first. Uh, how has COVID affected you these past two years? Uh, well, pretty much probably about the same as um, your average you know, your average American. I have, I've had to wear a mask. Um, pretty much anywhere I go with people, there's been a mask. Um, none of my family, no one close to me has uh, even gotten COVID, let alone passed from COVID. Um, so really, uh, honestly, the only key difference is just not being able to go like to the movies or just those, those social um, the social aspects of it. Other than that, how about yourself? Oh boy, I've well, it's been quite two years. Put that way. Um, 
luckily I have not contracted it. I have friends and family that have contracted it, including my uh, mother. Okay. Though, though, uh, it's possible that it wasn't COVID; it was something else. But I don't. I mean, she got vaccinated just as I have, and I guess you could possibly count it as a breakthrough infection. Right. But uh, yeah, as she's of okay at, with it. she's okay though. Yeah, she's fine, and symptoms were if if she did have COVID, it was very mild symptoms that like affected her for like a day or two. That's it. Okay. All right. Good. Yeah, and. Uh, other than that, I'm I'm personally back to wearing a mask because, uh, like everywhere in yeah. the U.S., Delta is just raging in Michigan. Oh yeah, yeah, and, yeah. I'm back to wearing a mask. Yeah, at, yeah, and uh, actually, I was in Chicago this past weekend where uh, where Delta is honestly raging there too. Yeah, um, they have a system in Chicago where uh, they they have travel advisories to certain states. Like, mm-hmm. Michigan got put on there twice. But, uh, yeah, as of right now, everywhere in the U.S., they advise you not to travel to. Wow, okay. Wow. Lear- literally stay in Chicago. You no, know, don't go anywhere else. It's that bad. Wow. But then again, me... Yeah, but we're a little bit shielded from that level here in Kentucky. We don't have, you know... We don't have big cities and things and things. We're a lot of people, a lot of populace, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. We're kind of out here in the in the hills and spread out a little more. And if you do go somewhere, it's not a very big crowd, you know. Yeah. Well, also, also too, uh, when I was in Chicago last weekend, it was for a Pitchfork Music Festival, which well, I which cool. which I got a ticket to before uh, Delta hit. You know, before I knew all this shit was gonna happen, and. Uh, uh-huh. Yeah, I would say 25%, maybe less of the people there were wearing masks. Including oh, my... Wow. I was one of the few doing it. Yeah. Everyone had to either show proof of vaccination or get a rapid test, though, so... Okay. It's one of those things where, like, everyone's trying to stay open, but... God damn, it's bad. Yeah. Well, it's like I was telling my wife. Uh, Heather <clears throat> recently you know it's hard for two years to stay constantly afraid more or less yeah, if you think yeah, about it, yeah you just burn out eventually like yeah, I like like I, I honestly freaked out last year cause uh you know plague ravaging the planet pretty scary yeah it was at a point there but, but, af- but after a while like uh I would say more than others, I just kind of got used to it. And yeah. even now, like, at Pitchfork, like, honestly, I wore my mask, and uh, if things got too crowded around me, I would walk away. That's about it. Well, that's all you could do, wouldn't it? Yeah, I know, but it's not like, oh, my God, uh. Right, yeah, you weren't panicked out. Now, there's some people, I know some folks, some of my friends who have complicated health situations, and they have just stayed terrified for two years, but that's that's not the norm. Well, well, honestly, I don't I don't blame them because, uh, as you said, they uh, they have help. Uh, sorry, they uh, have immune systems which are uh, make yeah. them much more successful than you and I are. Yeah, even if we weren't vaccinated. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Okay. Enough sad COVID talk. <laughs> But let's let's, yeah. uh, let's get back to pancake. Um, yeah how how did you get into pancakes work? Um, I had a buddy of mine. He is uh, one of these folks, and I am too. Where you know he can get on Wikipedia and just rabbit hole and rabbit jump for like hours, right? Oh God, I know where this is going because that's how I yeah. discovered pancake. I was just okay. going down yeah. a Wikipedia rabbit hole, then I see on some list of whatever, mm-hmm. or category, like, Brees DJ Pancake. I'm like, huh, that's quite a name. Click. Yeah, it's on. <laughs> then I've I read the entry, read the tragic story, and read mm-hmm. the work, and I got hooked. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but, yeah, that's, that's the same story for me, except there was a buddy of mine who had come across him, and he said, um, there's a guy 
guy you want to check out, you know. And so I went to the Wikipedia page like you're talking about, linked up, found the collection, read it. So, and I'd say a lot of people's stories about how they came across him, I'd say, are really similar. You know, he's sort of underground. Oh yeah. Um, by the way, what does uh, the DJ part of his name mean? Does it mean anything? Okay. Well, his original actual name was <clears throat> Brees Dexter Pancake. That's his given name. Ah, okay. Yeah. Um, he converted to Catholicism while in graduate school and added the name John. So we got Brees Dexter John Pancake, right? Right. Oh, well, okay. I see it now. Yeah, but if you'll notice, there's the D and then there's the apostrophe um, J, right? Right. It's not the... So here's how that happened. He submitted a short story to the Atlantic Monthly, and he put in there, you know, for his byline, Brees D dot um, J dot Pancake, just like his initials, right? Mm -hmm. Well, there was a misprint. The, the magazine actually misprinted it and instead put the apostrophe there, D apostrophe J. And he just told them to leave it that way. Ah, uh, he just went with it. He just went with it, and uh, that's what's on his uh, gravestone in Milton. Well, he was a braver writer than I am when it comes to name screw-ups, because uh, I constantly have to tell people that write about me, Hey, it's Garrett with one T, not two. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's... I, I've let some slide, but other times it's like, Hey, what the fuck? It's one T. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, well, that's your name. You know, that's your name, man. Yeah. Um, most I've ever had happen that I've actually asked someone to change, and I quit doing it, is if they left my middle, in the, uh, my middle name out, Lee. Oh, okay. Yeah, because... Um, I don't know. I want my full name on there, so. Yeah, yeah. When I discovered Pancake too, uh, guy, I think it was near the end of high school. And being the teenage dickhead that I kind of was, I was making some jokes to friends about him being an actual DJ that he put into his name. Yeah. Then I, I don't know. I did some like. DJ Skrillex comparison or something. <laughs> Did you really? Yeah. Oh, I, I, didn't catch, I didn't get that until just yeah, now. DJ, it, like DJ. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it was very. It was a very unfunny joke. I'm very ashamed. Uh, I, I'm very ashamed how unfunny I was back then. Nah. I'm funnier. You know, I'm funnier now, thank God. Which is why people. Right. Which is why I have so many fans of hashtag <laughs> powerful GSV. Please, <laughs> Lord of mercy. Okay. All right. So uh, you you've been working on this uh, biography turned memoir since 2018, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, what 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 made it transition from a just your standard biography to a memoir? Um. Well, I have really good. Um, I have uh, really good editing advice from from the press that's. Uh, it's coming out with West Virginia University Press. And they've given me a lot of good advice now. They've put me through seven or eight drafts, complete, almost complete rewrites. Um, and sort of guided, they saw basically when I was trying to do the biographical approach, they saw that I was putting in a lot of my own uh, life and how it sort of compared or paralleled with Pancake. So they just started noticing that it would be better fit as a, uh, a memoir kind, a memoir kind of uh, approach. Uh, I was just writing about Pancake. Um, I had written a few essays and about him, and so I had one in particular that I knew was a good uh, springboard essay to start a book. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much what I did. I wrote a short story um, about Pancake in much the same uh, way that uh, Raymond Carver wrote one about Chekhov. I actually made, I did it that way because of Carver's story. Uh, he wrote a story about Chekhov's last day, right? Right. And so I was doing, doing the same thing with Pancake. I'd written an essay, so I had some material. And um, I, I had published, I had published one of my essays, self-published one, put it out online. And um, they got a hold of me from West Virginia University 
Associated Press and asked me if I'd be interested in writing a book about him. And that's how it started, and I just started from there. And uh, like I said, over the course of several drafts, it's kind of a it's a slim book. It's a, you know, it's not uh, anything. It's no tome. It's not trying to be a biography. Um, and that's what I'm. I finished the last draft recently, and they sent it out for readers. And uh, whatever the readers bring back. With as far as uh, any suggestions, which would only be small fixes, it couldn't be anything big at this point, you know. Mm-hmm. So pretty close. It's going to come out sometime next year. I, I would think probably late next year, some sometime in the fall, maybe. Oh, very nice. Okay, uh, last question here. I guess it's a big, wide-ranging one. So uh, prepare yeah. yourself. All right, I'm ready. All right. Um. Well, first of all, uh, when did uh, Pancake pass? Yeah, he passed in 1979. All right. April 8th, 1979. Yeah. 89, 99, 2009, 919. Yeah, uh, it's been well over 40 years now. Uh, what do what you see as uh, Pancake's influence? Is it still there? or? Uh, oh, uh, wait a minute. He passed in 1979. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So it's been about over 40 years since his passing. Um, yeah. What's his... Yeah, uh, yeah, what's his influence uh, like today? I, I think that among um, people who are writing from Appalachia, and there are, they everyone knows him. We're aware of him. He's a large presence. Um, he wrote very his work, and, and you've read it. It was very brave, and he didn't really uh, he didn't care to really put things out there that was kind of taboo at the time to write about in Appalachia. So I think his influence is still felt among, um, definitely among Appalachian writers, and even, even I would say safely say throughout a great deal of Southern writers, as however people would typify those kinds of writers. Um, his influence is, I don't know if you wanted to put it on a one to ten, he's probably middle of the pack as far as because um, most writers don't know him. Well, the. The ones that aren't cool like you and I. Exactly. <laughs> the uncool have no idea about him. Yeah. If it, <laughs> you hear here, folks, on GSP, if if you don't know the work of Breeze DJ Pancake, Pancake yep. you are fucking lame. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree 100%. Yeah, fi- fix that by looking him up and getting his collected short stories on print or on Kindle. Seriously, do it, folks. It's really good writing. It really is. All right, uh, Sheldon, uh, we got a good hour and, hold on, yeah, a good hour and 17 minutes now. Uh, yes, indeed. Yeah, man, uh, anything you want, anything else you would like to talk about? Because, uh, yeah, I no, think we, I think we, we got everything. It, it's been, a, it's been, this is probably the, as far as I've did a few of these, and uh, you've just been awesome to talk to, buddy. I mean, this has been great. Yeah, it's been good hearing from you, too. And uh, actually, I just remembered it now. Uh, the first time you and I met, uh, uh-huh. I remember submitting, I believe it was a poem to Revolution John. Okay. And, yeah. uh, well, I don't know if you remember it, but I sure do. Guess what, right. folks? Shell and Lee Compton rejected me. You, yes, you did. You you wrote back simply, thanks for the submission, but I do not believe that's a good fit here. I did like okay. it, though. And you encouraged me to submit some more, which I did. Okay. And you good. published yeah, yeah. more of my work. And, uh, yes. And I believe I came in, like, third place for, like, a, a award. Highlander Award. Uh, what is it? Highlander Award, yeah, the yep. short story company. Yep, I came in third place, so. You sure did. You sure did. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and that there's perseverance, man. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. So. I'm, I'm always glad to see you, man. In the inbox, I really am. I love publishing your stuff. You do good work. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate that, and uh, mm-hmm. hopefully, I'll have something new you coming out probably next year. Sounds great, bud. All right, dude. Uh, let's do some promo stuff. Uh, your collected short stories. When is it coming out, and when can where can people find it? Uh, it'll be coming out in November of this year. 
your first place you want to go to look for that would be Amazon. Um, Cowboy Jamboree Press uh, publishes through Amazon. So uh, you could look it up there, Collected Story, Sheldon Lee Compton. Wait, uh, did we say, did you say what the title was? Yeah, the title is just The Collected Stories of Sheldon Lee Compton. All right, you first heard it here, folks. Uh, title reveal. Yes. Very, very epic. <laughs> okay. Nice. All right, yeah. all right. And uh, aside from that, where else can people learn more about you, your work, or if they want to submit work to you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I have a website that a writer's website that I've had since two thousand and nine. It's called Bent Country. B e n t Country. And uh, if you if you you know if you Google that with my name, it'll it'll take you right to it. And it's got everything pretty much since two thousand nine. It's got all my uh, bio info. It's got my links to my stories, my books, and everything. So, all right, great. Uh, hold on a sec. <clears throat> ah, allergies, love it. Hey, <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, folks. Uh, Sheldon Lee Compton. Sheldon, thanks for coming on. Thanks, Garrett, for having me, bub. It's been fun. Yep, and uh, folks, thank you for listening. If you want, as always, if you want to learn more about me, about my work, the Godin series, this podcast, other stuff I'm doing, check out my official website, garrettshelke.tumblr.com. Find me on Twitter, at Garrett Shelke. Uh, you can find this podcast on Anchor, iHeartRadio, Pandora, Spotify, um, smoke signals, I guess, wherever I can put it on for free. Not iTunes, though. I can never get it on that piece of shit website. <laughs> Steve Jobs is, is not a fan of GSP, unlike you good folks. All right. Thanks, Sheldon. Uh, nice talking with you. Thanks, Gary. You too, buddy. Yep. And thank you, everyone, for listening. Here is the outro song.
take my spot Of a life where I get my shot Yeah, and I grab my slice Uh, and I live that life Of a life where I take my spot of a life where I get my shot Where I get my shot Yeah, and I'll grab my slice Oh, uh, and I'll live that life Oh, uh, and I'll live that life